Hello, my name is Gustavo Balderas. I am the superintendent here in the Edmond School District, and I am happy uh, that you are joining us this evening in our high school forum presentation. And really, I'm thankful for all the staff that made this possible and all the staff that you'll be hearing from tonight from our high school folks um, with regards to just what the plans are and hopefully answering as many questions as possible during a short time. We also have a web page that's becoming more fully loaded with uh, with answers for folks. So if we don't get your questions answered tonight, please check the website and we will continue to have these meetings throughout the fall as we uh, embark in a very, uh, probably the most difficult startup that I've, that I've had in my 31 years in education and uh, 22, 22 years as an administrator is these past few months has been very, really grueling uh, for us and every other school district across the country. Uh, the situation, as we all know, does not allow us to come into our brick and mortar school to have traditional schooling, but uh, we will be started in a fully remote um, model that we hope to uh, move to a hybrid model when safe to do so for faculty and for and for students. I, I'm going to say something qu quickly for folks that uh, may need translation. Se necesita interpretación. Haga clic el botón que está abajo en la pantalla. Y la señora Patty está ahí para, para escuchar um, y para dar interpretación también. So, si necesitan si interpretación en español, que hagan clic el botón que está abajo en la pantalla. Gracias. Uh, I am now going to turn it over to uh, Greg Schwab, our assistant superintendent, who uh, leads our secondary schools as well as a lot of our, of our, our operations and Greg will take lead and um, be able to facilitate this. So thank you again, Greg, for being here and for everybody here on the call. Thank you, Dr. Balderas. And again, uh, I want to thank all of the all of the principals that are here tonight and other other staff that are here to help answer questions. And really our goal for tonight is to provide you with some information about what we think uh, the school year will look like as we launch in a remote setting. Um, and also to give you a chance to ask some questions. So I want to really quickly run through the agenda. Um, we're going to do some panelist intro introductions in just a moment. Uh, then I'm going to share some uh, updates on food and nutrition that I think are, is important information for all of our families to know. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the draft schedules for the high school, the, the six period day and the uh, three period block uh, in the remote setting. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how attendance works and what flexibility there is for students in, in the remote setting in attendance. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Canvas, the learning management system, uh, and then extracurricular activities and athletic programs. And then we'll touch on a little bit of how we plan to support the transition of our incoming ninth graders. And then the most important part of the evening is a chance for all of you to ask questions. You'll have an opportunity to put your questions in the Q&A box and uh, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. So uh, with that, I'm going to um, do some introductions. And again, uh, we all had a chance to meet Dr. Balderas. Um, and so I'd like to first ask uh, Allison, if you would please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Allison Larson and I'm the principal at Edmonds Woodway High School. Greg? Hi, I'm Greg Schellenberg, uh, principal at Mount Lake Terrace High School. Thanks for joining us tonight. And Dave? I'm Dave Shockley, principal of Meadowdale High School, and happy to be here, and hopefully we can answer your questions this evening. Mike? Good evening, Mike Piper, principal at Linwood High School. Go Royals. Andrea? Hi, I'm Andrea Hillman. I'm the principal at Scriber Lake High School. Welcome. And Christy? Hi, I'm Christy Frary, and I am the principal at Edmonds eLearning Academy. Scott. Hi, I'm Scott Mock, and I'm the principal at Edmonds Heights K-12, which is the parent partnership program in our school district. Uh, and Mark. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Madison. I'm the director of uh, secondary STEM, career technical education, and college and career readiness. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you. Uh, before we get started tonight, I would like to take uh, a moment to do a land acknowledgement. And so uh, we respectfully acknowledge that we are gathering today on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish tribes. The Edmonds School District wants to express our gratitude and appreciation to the indigenous people on whose territory we reside. 
Okay, so first, what I hope to touch on really quickly is just a few updates on the food and nutrition services and support that will be provided for the 2021 school year. Uh, as you may know, from the spring, our food and nutrition department did an amazing job of feeding students uh, uh, during, the, during the period of time that we were closed. And they have some updates that they wanted to pass along to all of you tonight. Um, and so I'll, I'll share a few of those with you now. The first thing um, to share is that the pandemic EBT funds uh, are still available to families uh, who, who qualify for free and reduced meals uh, and from March through June. And this is up to $400 per student. And so if you need to access those funds, um, there's a couple of ways to apply. One is the link that is listed there, washingtonconnection.org. Um, and you can also um, reach out to our food service department uh, for assistance if you need any help with that. We also wanted to encourage families that qualify to make sure they complete the free and reduced applications, uh, which are available at the school office, online, and at each of the school meal sites that will be operating this fall. Um, and again, we really encourage all families to take advantage of this program. And you can turn in your completed applications here at the, at the ESC, uh, at your school office, or at any of the meal sites that are around the district. We also wanted to let you know that beginning September 9th, school meal kits will include five breakfasts and five lunches, and fall meal service will, will be available to enrolled students from preschool through grade 12 at their eligibility status, either free, reduced, or paid lunch. Um, so we want to make sure that, that that will begin on September 9th, and you can collect your meals uh, at, the, at the meal locations by bringing your student ID and full name. You can also pre-register uh, for faster service, and the link is there. And you can also prepay online or complete an application for meal benefits prior to pickup. Uh, and again, we have a link to the full schedule on the district website. Okay, so let's transition now and talk a little bit about what we expect um, in the school year. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the six period day schedule. And I'm going to ask one of our one of our esteemed principals to uh, take a moment just to kind of walk through what a what a draft schedule. Uh, that we're looking at would look potentially look like in a six period day schedule. Mike Piper, could I ask you to talk about the six period day? Apologies, uh, Mike Piper, principal at Linwood High School. So what you're looking at here is um, one of the draft schedules that we have, which is a six period day schedule. Um, the day starts at with your first period class at nine o'clock. As you can see on the schedule, each class is 25 minutes in length with an advisory. And then there is time during this day too for uh, time to connect with teachers and staff um, after the, the school six period day. So, and then in that schedule as well, there's a Wednesday in between. And then that Wednesday is a, another day, an opportunity for students to connect with staff. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and we're gonna now uh, switch to the block schedule. And I believe uh, it was it Allison or Dave are, are gonna speak to the block schedule. Sorry, I think Dave was going to speak to the block schedule, but if he's not available, I can do that. Um, the block schedule is similar in um, the time, the student time as a six period day schedule. Um, there's odd, if you're an Edmonds Woodway student or a Meadowdale student, you'd be familiar with odd days and even days. That's also incorporated in this block schedule with an advisory period. And then um, just like the six period day schedule, there is Wednesdays where um, students can check in with teachers and each teachers will also use that time to prepare lessons um, on Wednesdays. Um, there is uh, office hours in the afternoon also for teachers um, and students to connect. Thank you. 
Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about attendance and Andrea Hillman is going to speak a little bit about attendance and flexibility. Um, hello again, I'm Andrea from Scriber Lake. Um, and this will be a change from the spring, but we will be taking attendance this fall in all of our classes. Um, the classes um, are going to be from nine to noon, like you just heard. And there will be um, some of built-in accountability with the attendance. Um, and so though it, you know, if it all turns out as planned, um, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, those are the days where attendance will be taken at the live synchronous or live Zoom sessions that their teachers are providing. And then um, on Wednesdays and between uh, after lunch in the afternoon, that, that's more work where students will be um, working on their independent assignments, preparing for their next synchronous sessions, um, and so there's not attendance for that, but attendance will be taken in the Zoom sessions. Um, and there, you know, we know that this is a difficult time for everybody and, and understand that there are times when students may not be able to access the live Zoom. Um, and so and we're gonna get up and running and we're gonna figure it out. Um, but as always, we encourage students who um, miss class to connect with their teacher, um, see, watch any recorded content in their Canvas page from that class period that they missed, um, email their teachers, use Remind to communicate with their teachers. Remind is a tool we will be using in our district this fall. Um, more on that another time. Um, and to submit the work that they missed in the event that they missed, just like if we were in regular school, absent work counts, they need to do it. Um, and always, always check your Canvas account. There is a parent portal um, as well as a student portal and app on your phone. Um, and so all of that is, is useful and um, can, can play into that idea of, of attendance, even if we are not um, live in the same room together. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions that I wanted to make sure, or one of the things that I make sure, wanted to make sure we covered tonight was just to talk a little bit about Canvas. Um, and again, let, this gets back to last spring when we had, um, again, when we had to close and, and reopen remotely, uh, we had to do it very quickly. And I think there were, some, there were some things that we learned from that experience. And one of them was really trying to make sure that we had one consistent learning management system uh, that will be used by our teachers so that students and families would only have one place to log into uh, to, to get information about their classes. And so that's what Canvas is. We, Canvas is what is called a learning management system. And it is the place that I guess probably the best way to describe it is like a home base. Uh, it is where uh, information about classes is kept, assignments, um, videos, those things that teachers post for students to complete. Uh, along with Zoom, it's going to be the primary way that our teachers communicate, our teachers and students communicate with one another. And it's also that electronic resource for students to get work that teachers assign. And it's also the place where students will uh, submit their work uh, for evaluation and grading. So that's a little bit about Canvas. And, and um, I will, I'll put a plug in now for a, a technology community forum that's coming up next week where, where we may have a little more information about Canvas, but we also know that we have some work to do to make sure that our students and families know how to get into Canvas and how to navigate that. So there will be more information on that to come. Okay, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Dave Shockley to talk a little bit about athletics and extracurricular activities. Thank you, Mr. Schwab. Uh, Dave Shockley, principal of Meadowdale High School. Uh, wanna talk about, first talk about athletics as it applies across the district for all of our comprehensive high schools or our schools that offer athletics. Uh, athletics, I want to make it clear, are not canceled this year. They are just postponed. Uh, at this point, we have moved uh, the, the football season. Instead of being in the fall or other fall sports, uh, they have been moved to either midwinter or to the uh, spring. And winter basketball season will start a little bit later than our winter season will start a little bit later than normal. In, in December and our hope is 
We know how important athletics is to the life of high school students, how important it is to families. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we give our students those opportunities. And so uh, the WIAA, which is the governing body of athletics in the state of Washington, has not canceled any of our sports seasons. They have just gotten together and uh, pushed them back uh, a little bit in hopes that COVID will pass and we'll be able to uh, do that important part of high school life. Also with extracurricular activities, uh, I think this might vary a little bit from school to school, but many of our clubs like LSU, BSU, Pride Club, Drama Club, other clubs will have the opportunity to meet. They will be meeting in virtual Zoom meetings more than likely. Uh, I can speak to Meadowdale last spring. We also were able to have music performances put together um, in a pre-recorded fashion and it worked out really well for graduation. We were also able to have a drama production that was pre-recorded and broadcast uh, in a socially distant responsible manner. And so I'm sure the same opportunities will take place at the other high schools as well, because we understand that athletics, extracurricular activities, clubs, all of those things are very important to our students. And it's our goal to make sure that the students have those opportunities uh, whenever possible. So um, hopefully if you have any questions, you can put those in the Q&A and we'll try to answer them later on this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, and so now I'm gonna ask Mike Piper, if he would mind to come, mind coming back on and talk a little bit about how we're gonna support uh, the transition to ninth grade for, as well as how we're gonna support our students that are new to our high schools. Thanks, Greg. Again, my name is Mike Piper, service principal at Linwood High School. But one of my favorite activities during the school year is our freshman orientation. In our district, we use a nationwide program known as Link Crew. Link Crew's focus is to assist our ninth graders with their transition to high school by partnering them with upper class students and then building activities designed to help them learn about the school and the community. Historically, this has meant students have taken a bus ride to school and have walked their schedule during the orientation. But with COVID, we've had to reimagine what orientation would look like with the same goal still in mind of connecting our incoming students with staff and upper class student leaders through fun and engaging activities that would build community knowledge about our school. This year, Link Crew will be virtual. For Linwood High, ours will be on September 3rd. We're really excited about orientation, the activities our students will be engaged with online. While it's not gonna be the same, we're excited about some of the new opportunities this online version will bring for our students. For example, in my introduction, I'm able to hit a half court shot in my very first try, and that's something I could never do without some pre-recording. Uh, aside from Link Crew, we have a, a grant funded program called Jumpstart. Historically, this program has been a summer orientation leading up to the year. This year, we're gonna embed it where students will have the opportunity to be in infinity and cohort groups. That's gonna provide ongoing mentorship and check and connects throughout at least the first semester for our ninth grade students. And we also have, as um, talked about earlier in our draft schedules, advisory time built into the school day. Through advisory, we hope to embed and connect many of the community building opportunities we have going on in the school, social emotional learning, and academic supports and other supports that our students need. We really believe that ninth grade, much like kindergarten and seventh grade, is one of the most important years in a student's K-12 life. It sets a strong foundation for the time coming up for them to propel them for the next four years. And we're excited about the programs and supports we have in place to do this. Thank you, Mike. So um, that concludes the uh, information that we had that we wanted to present to all of you. And so now it's an opportunity for uh, us to try to answer some of the questions that uh, you all are putting into the Q&A. And so at this point, we're gonna stop sharing the slide presentation and uh, all of our panelists are gonna turn on their videos and we're gonna take a look at the questions and I'm gonna do some moderating and um, I'm gonna just ask, throw questions out and if you feel like you can answer the question, fantastic. Uh, to my panelists that are on here, um, I may actually point to a couple of you too and ask you specifically to speak to a question that might apply to, to your school. Um, so one of the first questions uh, is about the Zoom meetings that 
uh, teachers will be having with their students and whether or not those are going to be recorded. Um, and so does anyone feel like they can speak to that question? Andrea. Um, yes, I'm Andrea again from Scriber Lake High School. Um, there is an expectation that all teachers will be hosting synchronous lessons, live lessons on Zoom. Um, most of the lessons um, in their entirety will not be recorded because there are some privacy issues um, and, and some laws and some policies that we need to uphold. Um, and so we are encouraging our staff um, to include videos of the content of the lesson to the best of their ability. Um, several shorter videos are more um, appropriate probably than a long um, either 30 or 45 minute video anyway. So um, in terms of a full lesson video, the answer to that is no. And we are hoping that staff will include videos um, that are briefer and cover the content. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so for those of you that we talked a little bit about this, but it seems like it might be good to spend a little more, a little more time talking about what we think classes like band, choir, and drama will look like in a remote setting. So um, anyone want to speak to that one? And speak to some of that um, because I've been working with my music teachers at Edmonds Woodway. This is Allison Larson at Edmonds Woodway um, in case you are on phone rather than video. Um, so our teachers are looking at, um, of course, some independent work with uh, their music classes and drama classes, but also they understand the importance of the community and collaboration that can happen in a music program. And so they're looking at some software that will um, help students be able to record and put uh, short pieces together as a group and submit those and get feedback from them. So the um, teachers will provide more information for students around that, but that's, that's their plan is to try and provide as much as possible that collaborative um, kind of nature of music programs and drama programs. And that same software will be able to allow them to perform um, as well in a coordinated effort. So band drama will be able to be able to broadcast those at a later date. Um, question uh, about information nights that were originally scheduled back in March before we closed. Um, some of the information nights for high schools were canceled back in March. Will individual high schools be doing anything on Zoom to replace those that are school specific? Can we? Can each of you talk about your school specific specific information nights coming up? Sure, Greg. I can start. This is Greg Schellenberg of Mount Lake Terrace. Um, we are identifying dates that we can do uh, an, an evening such as this, where there would be a webinar with a chance to present and do a, a Q and A, but also to uh, record some podcasts with some. Uh, known frequently asked questions and 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 presentation that way. So there'd be two avenues: one to attend something like this, and then another to access uh, recorded information. At Edmonds Woodway, uh, we are planning um, similar kinds of activities for parents. Also, a lot of our spring parent information nights have to do with our international baccalaureate program. And I think I saw that as some of the questions in our list tonight. Our inter international baccalaureate coordinator, Nick Wellington, will be contacting um, those students um, it, throughout the, um, all of our grades with information nights the second week of school. And also students will be given information about their cast hours that they need to complete. Uh, Meadowdale, this is Dave Shockley from Meadowdale High School. Meadowdale High School is also looking for, for dates and times that we'll get out uh, as soon as we set those. Uh, the, no, the first one will be our freshman information night, which will coincide with some of the link activities, which will be 
the dates will be published very soon on those and then we'll have a general information night uh, for the rest of the school as well uh, as we get closer to the start of school. So be watching for those dates. Mike Piper at Linwood High School. If you're in the Linwood High community, you should have been receiving emails from me already on upcoming dates that we're gonna have. If you're not receiving those emails and notifications, uh, please let me know. We'll check and make sure that you're that we have the correct contact information for you. It's also on our website. But anything that we were doing last year in person, all those activities, we are reimagining and rethinking how to do that online. We're gonna have our freshman orientation uh, night for our families on September 15. And much like the other schools, we're gonna be providing, and the fancy way to say it is synchronous and asynchronous learning. I like saying live and on demand. So ways that you can interact right with us and also ways you can access the information on your own time. Um, I'm Christy Frary and the principal at Edmonds eLearning Academy. And uh, like everyone else, we're looking for a date. Um, we're uh, kind of circling around possibly September 2nd, uh, where we will do an evening webinar to, um, for questions and answers from the community and families uh, interested in Edmonds eLearning Academy. At Scriber, hello, this is Andrea again from Scriber. We have um, very frequent information nights um, and we will likely be, well, we also have orientations for families and students. Um, and finally, we will be probably repurposing our um, back to school night um, or open house. And we will publish that date um, to be in mid to late September. Thank you. This is Scott at Edmonds Heights, and we run a weeks long orientation process for our new families that began this week. And so that sort of takes the place of our information nights. All right, um, a question that um, I'm not surprised came up uh, about schedules and uh, when uh, students might expect to see their schedules for the year, because I know there's a lot of work going on right now about that. So um, any, anyone, any folks want to weigh in on, on what the thinking is around schedules for students? This is Allison at Edmonds Woodway. I know we have a plan for releasing our schedules to students on September 4th, and, um, and students can access that through their Skyward account. Uh, this is uh, Greg at Mount Lake Terrace, and it is the exact same answer, September 4th and through Skyward. Mike Piper at Linwood High School, September 4th for us as well. Hey, Chalkley Meadowdale High School, I guess it'll be September 4th as well. I did want to add to that, um, that our schools are working very hard right now. We've, we threw an almost impossible task at them uh, in early August. And uh, when we were also working on, and we're continuing to work on dividing our student bodies up into A and B cohorts for the eventual uh, day that we open uh, in for some in-person learning again, we'll be using a hybrid model with students in A and B cohorts. And so one of the things we asked the high schools to do now uh, was to work on splitting their students up into cohorts uh, so that the lion's share of that work was done in August rather than trying to do it in October if we were planning to reopen for some in-person learning in November as an example. That means that they had to take apart schedules and put them back together again. And that's been a significant ask and they've, and they've really done an amazing job. So related to that is a question that I think I'll tackle, which is, um, that we have, we're, we're dividing students into cohorts based on the alphabet of their last name. And um, so students in A, last names A through LE will be in cohort A, and then last names LEA through Z will be in cohort B. One of our commitments is to make sure that students who are at different grade levels in the same household um, have, uh, uh, have are um, are in the same cohort. I got lost my train of thought there for a second. Uh, they're on. They're in the same cohort, uh, 
and even if they have student, if they have last names in the in the same household, so that's um, that's a pretty huge juggling task to try to make uh, to try to make work. Um, and so that's what we're working on right now. And I know that there are going to be some requests for can I change my cohort? Um, and we're going to probably not be able to accommodate special requests for changes in cohorts because. Um, it, it, it's, just, it's very complex as it is to try to balance cohorts. And so um, we understand that there may be some really compelling needs to change cohorts, but unfortunately we, we just can't do that um, and, and create the balanced cohorts that we need to create so that we can open for in-person learning uh, and maintain socially distanced classrooms. So that's the work that's happening and more to come on that. But uh, that's a little bit about why the schedules were, um, were are, are a little bit more delayed than they might normally be. Um, Question about advisories. And so I, one of the things that you heard um, when we talked about the schedules was um, that each of our schedules has an advisory period, a 15 minute block of time for advisory. And uh, I'm gonna ask Mark Madison, uh, who in addition to being our CTE director also supports our secondary guidance counselors uh, to talk a little bit about um, social emotional learning and how advisory could be used to support that and why, why we feel that advisory is important. Thank you, Greg. And again, this is Mark Madison, uh, Director of Career and Technical Education. So uh, yes, I mean, one of the things that we all realize and acknowledge is that um, in addition to this being a very difficult learning situation, it is also a very challenging um, social emotional situation for students. Um, we know, and I know personally and checking in with students in the spring there was a lot of struggle with anxiety and um, isolation, depression, and the need for them to feel as though they had an adult that they could regularly connect to um, was critical. And so the purpose of advisory and particularly its importance in a remote and hybrid learning environment is to provide that individual adult that those students will connect with regularly um, and as part of that connection will be uh, modeling and processing and um, developing skills for dealing with the anxiety, being able to address the anxiety, um, and just to develop that social connection back to school. Um, that, is the, that is a major challenge in a remote isolated learning situation. The other part to social emotional learning is it won't simply be advisory, but it will be a challenge for all of our counselors and instructors and administrators to focus very specifically on making sure students are socially connected, making sure that there is opportunity to talk about what they're going through, the challenges they're dealing with. There's a lot going on in our society that all of us are dealing with, and particularly our youth. And having that set time, particularly advisory, is a great opportunity for us to be able to allow students to um, feel the support and connection they need. Thank you, Mark. So a couple of questions about schedules and the block schedule versus the six period day schedule. And I know that we have two of our comprehensive high schools that are already on a block schedule. And I think we'll be using the hybrid ver or the remote learning version of a block schedule. And right now we have two of our high schools that are on a six period day uh, and are right now planning to use the six period day schedule. Although I think there's some conversation happening at both of those schools. Um, so I, maybe um, Mike and Greg, if you could both speak to, because you're the six period day schools and these questions are more Linwood and Mount Lake specific about why the six period day versus the block. And are you guys planning to make that transition? Let me start, Greg. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Mike Piper at Linwood High School. Yeah, our, our default place would be that six period schedule. There is a discussion right now in our community around which schedule would work best for students and staff. Uh, everyone in our community, uh, students and families, you'll be getting an email from me on Monday that does have a link. We wanna get some feedback from you on which schedule you prefer. I've heard compelling arguments uh, for both. Um, and we're gonna to try to make that decision as quickly as we can as a community for what works best for us. Uh, 
Hi, this is Greg at Mount Lake Terrace, and uh, we are very similar. In fact, we're we're also sending out, um, we're floating a survey out to the community uh, early next week, probably Monday, and um, our teachers have been discussing uh, the chance to switch to um, to a block schedule during this remote learning, and. Um, some of the reasons to do that would be if you look at a 25 minute period versus a 50 minute period, you would uh, you would think that there would be classes that would benefit from a longer period of time. Uh, but on the other side, uh, we just heard about social emotional learning and, and a lot of teachers are uh, very intent to retain the uh, the daily check in with students and to make sure that, uh, that 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 kids are OK and they can they can see them and talk with them every day. And, and so we'll be balancing all that with the community feedback and, and making a decision as soon as we can. Um, so a quite, I, there's a, a few questions about electives and I wanna ask Mark again in his role as CTE director now to speak a little bit about how CTE, because that's a, bulk, a lot of our electives do fall into the CTE category and how, how um, our CTE teachers are planning to approach some of their elective courses. Thank you, Greg. And again, this is Mark Madison, Director of Career and Technical Education. So uh, yes, certainly um, classes such as Career and Technical Education, which are known really for um, being very much hands-on, project-based, using industry software and equipment, um, and having very specialized facilities, do face a unique challenge in a remote learning environment. That being said, um, I will tell you that our teachers have been up to the task. They have averaged about 30 to 40 hours of time just this month, preparing their instructional plans for the fall to be able to provide as much hands-on instruction and access to students, uh, excuse me, access to industry software and tools as is feasible. Um, I did notice there was a question around auto, and I'll speak specifically to that because there is a very creative solution that our instructor came up with. Um, he actually secured a grant through an organization called Foundry 10 to purchase toolkits for all students in the automotive technology program that they will be able to have at home and retain uh, upon closure of the course. Um, the toolkits will be used for hands-on um, engine projects, small engine projects that students will be able to work on at home through um, a rotation of engines and equipment, small equipment that students will be able to pick up from the school and work on and bring back, um, which is um, very much out of the box thinking. And I can tell you in working with those teachers this summer, there's a lot of that out of the box thinking going on. Um, Many of our teachers are, are preparing materials and kits so that um, students can pick those up and actually do hands-on projects at home. Um, we have purchased a lot of um, innovative software solutions to be able to allow students to have access to industry-based software such as Adobe Creative Suite, uh, SolidWorks for uh, CAD and 3D modeling, um, Microsoft Office, uh, for certification purposes, all utilizing their Chromebook. So um, there have been a lot of um, creative ideas that have been developed and good instructional planning that's taken place. And, you know, while certainly things such as building, um, you know, we build a residential home every year in our carpentry, pro carpentry program, and that may be put on hold for a bit because it's very difficult to build a home from your uh, kitchen table. But um, we are doing some creative things, for instance, with local industry. Well, perhaps we can hire some of our students outside of the school day um, to actually work, get that hands-on experience, get paid, and earn high school credit as well. So we have a number of things that we're trying to do to make this as meaningful and engaging as possible. Thank you, Mark. Uh, this is a specific question, and I'm going to ask Allison Larson to speak to it. And it, it's about the IB program again. Uh, and um, how will IB students learn the material for exams, given that they're only in classes for two hours uh, per week per subject? 
Um, so this is Allison Larson at Edmonds Woodway. The uh, IB, which is an international organization, is uh, working to revise some of its curriculum and its assessment requirements and the mode of assessing students in order to accommodate across the world um, school closures and difficulties with students going to school during a pandemic. And so they're working uh, closely with all of their schools, including ours, regarding what is the new requirements and how are they narrowing down the curriculum for students who can't attend school um, in, the, in the full way that, um, that they used to be able to. And so students will be learning more about that from our IB coordinator as we set up those parent meetings and then also from their teachers as they get into the class. Um, we expect that students will still be able to meet um, the requirements and having a, an enriching and rigorous program that we always expect from our IB classes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Scott Mock if you wouldn't mind. He's had some experience at the state level with work on grading. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to questions about what grading might look like this school year. Uh, and maybe speak to how it's going to be different from last spring. Um, I will do my best. Um, so a little context, I work in a non-graded school, so I will do my best not to put my colleagues on the spot. Um, so the discussions at the state level um, really were about trying to create the ability for districts to make decisions on their own um, about how grading is going to function. And the encouragement is to change grading practices to uh, um, a more up-to-date grading practice using standards-based grading. So I'm not sure exactly how that's going to play out in our schools because I haven't been part of those discussions. But the encouragement, again, is to go through a process to create standards-based grading that may not include uh, aspects like attendance or participation because they're not standards-based. They're, 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 they're something you do um, rather than something you show you know how to do. So that's kind of where that's going. And again, I haven't been part of the discussions in our school district yet, but um, that's, uh, I imagine one of my colleagues might be able to, to talk more about how that's playing out in, in your schools. So what I can also add is, I think that probably the most important thing for parents and students to know is that um, how we, what we did for grading last spring is not going to be what we do for grading in the fall. There will be an expectation of, of grades being given um, and that, um, you know, the, but the question becomes, how do we, how do we implement a grading policy that is, that as Dr. Mock talked about, uh, is really truly standards based and moves away from grading behavior, um, behaviors to really focusing more on what students can, can show that they can do. Uh, relative to what the standards are for the courses. So we are working on it. And again, we will have, um, uh, we'll have guidance out before school starts. I can't tell you what that is today, but I want you to know um, that grading is going to be different. Uh, it, and it will be, there will be accountability for students in terms of the work they do, uh, and they will be assessed uh, and, and they will be earning letter grades uh, for their courses. So um, I want to, see um, a question about, um, and I know this, again, this, we, we, ha we haven't really experienced this yet uh, because we haven't really done full remote in, in, this, in this method this year, but what did, what, do you, um, what did we see teachers doing last spring? A uh, question about what will teachers be doing in an online setting? What are the kinds of experiences that students can expect to have? Um, so think about a little bit about some of the classrooms that we saw last spring and maybe some folks can speak to that. I think that this is Scott from Edmonton Heights. I think one of the things we're encouraging, there's a dragonfly in my office, if you, in case you can hear that. Um, the, the, uh, essentially, I think we're trying to look at, at planning as a week long process because it includes synchronous and asynchronous learning. And so it's not going to be planning a particular lesson then another lesson then another lesson um, because of the way the schedule may work, whether it's a block or a one-off thing. So in my school, it'll probably look like um, something akin to learning outside the classroom and then coming to the classroom to actually apply whatever kids have learned. Um, and, and so that, that, that may be something of what's going on. I know I'm encouraging my teachers and I know my colleagues are as well as like, um, 
really the, the time with the kids is going to be about engagement, really connecting and, and giving them their, our best stuff because uh, it, there's not that much time. So we want to make sure that the time that we have with them is, is really engaging. That, that's my take on what we're doing. Mike Piper at Lewin High School, just to um, add to and piggyback to Dr. Mock there, which is as difficult as this time has been for all of us, it's also been um, a time for innovation, a time for learning new ideas and, um, and being creative with our students and breaking through some of those barriers that have held us back. And we had a really um, excellent keynote speaker come to our district last week um, to speak on this. And I saw in the Q&A one question, what can be done in a 25 minute class? And when I saw that schedule, that was one of my first reactions was, man, that's a short amount of time. But as I've been, we have an e-curriculum committee in our building. As I've been listening to our teachers and watching them plan and prepare and observing what they're doing, a lot of them really favor that 25 minute model because it allows for the quick community building, check-in, uh, what, what I'm calling live learning. And then it sets, sets the class up for asynchronous learning. And for a lot of learners, that's a more ideal way to learn. You think about outside of the six, kind of the bell to bell day that we live in in schools and what it's like in the real world, it really does help to train and prepare our kids for some of the experiences many will be facing after high school. This is Allison at Edmonds Woodway to add on to what Dr. Mock and Mr. Piper said. Um, some things that our teachers are talking about and what I saw happening in the spring was um, what teachers call flipped classroom, where students have uh, their learning happen outside the classroom that is really the content. And then when they come to class, they're using the material that they learn to process and discuss and get feedback from their teachers. Um, and so that preparation outside of the classroom is really important for students so that when they get into their online environment or their classroom at school, they can really engage in those discussions with their peers and getting the important feedback from teachers. And that's really the, the important part of when they're learning and applying that knowledge and it becomes really integrated into their, their brains and what they need to know. This is uh, Greg Schellenberg of Mount Lake Terrace. And I think, um, I think most of our teachers are not planning on trying to replicate everything the same way. Um, and, and some of the activities they do, do transfer. I remember a, uh, a math teacher that uh, was pretty excited to show me that, uh, you know, the guided practice still works. You had, you had uh, some direct instruction and kids could show their, their answer on Zoom. I can't see it with my virtual background, but, uh, you know, some of that still worked. Um, another English teacher was able to do uh, some seminar discussions over, over the novel readings and, and things. So there are some things that that uh, will be familiar uh, to students, but then uh, there are other things that just are not uh, applicable and, and need to be rethought in another way. So the flip model classroom, some uh, uh, short recorded videos by the teachers um, are, are some of the things that we're looking at. Uh, question about zero and seventh period, uh, and how will those look in a remote setting? Sorry, it's Greg at Malik Terrace again. Um, I, I just had a conversation with the seventh period teacher today, and and uh, so we we've been talking about how the schedule is uh, 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 ending pretty late, and so we're to give kids that lunch break that's that's in the schedule, and then to resume the seventh period after that, um, with some flexibility for some students if uh, if getting their getting their uh, uh, time in before school could be could be an option as well. So so a scheduled time with some flexibility. Hey, if I could go back to the, the last question in a minute, Greg, I, I think one thing that we're finding out from all of our teachers, if you talking about a flipped classroom or or other types of teaching, that isn't really new. But what this has given our teachers uh, it's given them the opportunity to try new and innovative things and to, to deliver their instruction a little bit differently. And, and the flipped classroom is the classic example. We've been talking about that for years. 
a lot of people have been doing it, and now we have that opportunity to take that. Um, I'm talking with my teachers about, yeah, life has given us uh, lemons, but let's make lemonade out of it. And I think um, one of the silver linings or the lemonade out of this is we're going to have some new innovative ways of teaching that we may never go back to some of the real old models anymore. Uh, we may always have some sort of blended type of of teaching going on. And so I'm looking forward to see what our educational professionals can come up with because uh, necessity is the mother of all invention and, and they're going to embrace this opportunity now that the decisions are made uh, to be going to the model that we're going. And I'm just looking forward to watching what they create. So, um... This is, a, I think, a, real, a, a really interesting question that um, I think it, I understand the question, too. Can somebody explain what Wednesdays will look like uh, in plain language? And I'm going to maybe ask Allison to speak to that because I know she probably has a little bit more, uh, a, a little more background on that question. So, Allison, can you talk a little bit about what we think Wednesdays will look like? So, for students... Um, Wednesdays have a block of time that is uh, what we're calling asynchronous learning, which means that they have time to um, learn independently or to check in with their teachers or with work with their teachers in small groups to, um, to get support or to enrich the learning that they're doing. Uh, also on Wednesdays, teachers do have time to do some planning time um, while um, while we're going through kind of this new model of learning, um, teachers are needing to recreate some of the curriculum, some of the old things that they have been doing last year or that they're um, being able to pull out of their toolbox are not something that they, that easily just transfers into Canvas um, for students to access. So they are needing to recreate some things, um, create those videos, um, really think about how can I engage students when I'm not actually in the room with them, building their relationships and all of that takes a lot of planning on the teacher's part so that they can do a very careful, intentional job. And so on Wednesdays, they'll be using that time as well. And there are certain Wednesdays that will be um, what we're calling early release days, which are similar to what we've experienced, um, our whole community has experienced on Fridays in the past which provides time for professional development for teachers and for them to, to collaborate together. Um, I add one thing to maybe expect yeah. for students on, so in addition to our amazing teaching staff, we also have uh, superb classified staff in our building. And we've been working with our classified staff on uh, schedules to support students in the virtual environment. And so we are looking to for some students, Wednesday might be a day to be working with a teacher's aide in, in smaller study groups as well. Okay, I think we might have time for one or two. Yeah, let's just do that. Let's, we'll make this our last question of the day. And uh, it, it's a question, again, sort of related to electives, but how will PE work uh, in a remote setting? How do you envision PE working in a remote setting? This is Allison Edmonds Woodway. Um, I just spoke to my PE teachers just the other day about how um, they're going to present learning. Um, PE teachers are really focused on first making sure that students know how important um, it is to be physically active and the health benefits for that. And so there's some knowledge portion of the PE curriculum that focuses on how to manage a healthy lifestyle, how to incorporate exercise into your lifestyle. And then they have a lot of choices for students around how students can um, show that they are participating in active um, or <laughs> movement activities and being active, um, going for walks and uh, maybe doing yoga and giving uh, different options for students. Their focus really is um, making sure students are up and moving and taking care of their social emotional learning by getting out and exercising um, and maybe walking with parents and, um, and having a time to really uh, take that time to take care of themselves physically. So they're really focusing on that kind of, of things. And they have some technology that will help them. I know one 
um, PE teacher or my all of my PE teachers at my school use um, Map My Walk on students' cell phones and students can send in their documentation that they've gone for a walk and how far they've gone and then reflect upon how they're feeling about that. Okay, um, we're gonna transition really quickly back to the PowerPoint, but I wanted to thank you all for attending tonight again. We had 170 participants uh, attend tonight. Uh, we had about 120 questions and obviously we didn't get to them all. Uh, and so please know that um, we will be we we will capture all these questions and we will work on getting answers to them and getting them posted on our FAQ uh, page on our on our website about remote learning. So um, if it didn't get answered tonight, know that it will get answered. And um, uh, so thank you all again. I wanted to share a little bit of information about upcoming community forums that we have on Monday night. Uh, this coming Monday night, we have a childcare community forum. Uh, Tuesday is our technology forum, uh, and then we have a kindergarten forum on Wednesday night, an elementary school forum on Thursday night, and then a forum on student health um, on Monday, September 14th. And again, these all are listed on our district website as well. So again, I just really want to um, thank you all for attending tonight, and um, we really, we really do hope that uh, and, and we're very confident that we're going to have a positive start to the school year. We know this is not, uh, this is a school year unlike any other. And uh, our principals and, and assistant principals and teachers and all of our staff are working incredibly hard uh, to make sure that this school year goes well um, and that your students are supported in their learning and in their social emotional health and well being. Um, again, if you need any help or if you have other questions that you need to ask, please reach out to your schools. Uh, because we're here to help. We're here to answer questions. And um, please know that, uh, that uh, we want to make sure that you get the information you need so that you can support your student as well. So again, thank you all for attending tonight uh, and have a great rest of the week.